All right. Well, uh, this lesson, I said I was going to be talking about word problems and um, applications of linear equations. So these are basically word problems that use linear equations. And I have lots of examples in videos already. But the one thing that I don't have and that I get asked a lot is to have some sort of way to break down what kind of word problem each type of word problem is or how to know it's this particular type of problem and then how you solve it. So there's a lot of word problems that go into various categories. And they get separated into some categories, like our textbook has the geometry problems in one category and then like percent problems in another. But you can break it down further and you can see that if you can figure out what category it belongs to, then you know how to solve it because all of the problems that are in that category are solved very similarly. So I thought what I would do is I, I'm not going to have enough time to actually go through an example of every single type of, of these type of problems, but I, I'm going to go through explaining what the type is, how you know it's that type, what things you look for, how you solve it, that sort of thing. So you can use this as a reference when you start going through word problems. So first off, when we're solving word problems, there is a problem solving procedure that you should do when you are solving. And this is what I do. This is, you know, this is basically the procedure that I do. And this is what you should do. And sometimes I'll mix up the first two steps, kind of doing them at the same time. Um, sometimes I'll do the first three at the same time. But this is the basic procedure. So your first step is to read the problem carefully. And what I do when I read the problem is I start drawing pictures, making tables, writing down the information that, that I have, you know, kind of picking the problem apart. Then you assign a variable to represent your unknown value, or if there's more than one unknown, you might use more than one variable. And so you write down like h, and you could say h equals height. So you kind of write down the variable and then what it means. So that way you kind of know what your unknowns are and what you're looking for. And then if necessary, express any unknown values in terms of the variable. So that's something, and let me get my pen out. This is very common with the cutting into pieces types of problems where you have to do this. There are a few other types that use that as well, but um, the ones where you're cutting something into multiple pieces, you tend to have multiple unknowns and you express those unknowns in terms of one of the, of the un other unknowns. You'll, it'll make sense when you see it. Um, then after you've figured out all your variables and you've kind of made some notes and drawn pictures, then you start to write your equations. And you may have one equation or you may have two equations. Um, when you're solving linear equations, you generally don't have more than two equations. Two is going to be sort of the maximum that you'll have. And sometimes it's worth writing down in words what's going on and then write it down in, um, you know, as the equation kind of translated as math, to math from there. Because then you can, you've got it in words in a way that kind of makes sense. And then you're, you're translating that back using, um, and I've got a chart that I'm going to show you later, but using words that specifically mean things like multiply, divide, so on. So you got your equation, and then you're going to solve that. You know, that's once you've got that thing all set, then you just go and solve using the techniques we've learned so far. Then you should always check your answer. First, make sure it works in the equation so you didn't mess up your solving. And then if it does work, you need to make sure that your answer is reasonable. Does your answer make sense? Is this the answer to what the question is asking you? If it doesn't make sense, then that might be an indication that your original equation that you wrote is incorrect. So that would be, okay, I got, let's say you're solving for distance and you got a negative. We can't go negative in distance. So that's a sign that maybe you messed up um, if you, if it, you check the equation and it does work in the equation, that means your equation was probably written incorrectly. Um, sometimes you solve and you don't actually have the answer to the original question. You have 
an answer to part of the question, and then you have to go on and actually answer the question that was asked. So sometimes you have extra steps after you solve. So your step from solving isn't always your final answer. So once you've checked all that and you, you're sure that you have the answer, then you state your answer in a sentence using the context of the problem. So you don't just say the answer is two, you say the distance between the boat and the pier is two miles or something like that to put it in context so that it, it gives it meaning. You include units, you know, it has to have some meaning to it. It's more than just a number. So I've got this set up in larger categories and then the different types of problems within each category. So the first big category we're looking at are translations. So this is the type of problem where you take an English sentence, they're going to have to translate it in, into a math equation. So a lot of word problems require you to do this, where you're, you've got it written in words and you have to turn it into math. And um, so you know that your situation is like this. If they're using certain translating words like some product um, less decreased by total twice, you know, it'll say something like the cost of this meal was twice the cost of the other meal or things like that, where they're using these words. These are math type words that are indicating, oh, OK, I've got some math going on. So this is indicating you're going to have to translate that sentence into an equation. So there's this chart that I have here. So, you know, good to have handy when you download the PowerPoint. These are the words you're looking for. So there's words that indicate addition, words for subtraction, words for multiplication, words for division, and then words for like exponents. These are exponents for powers. And then things like square root. Um, there are other types like cubed root and stuff like that. But I wanted to put particularly the difference between a square and a square root. It's one word and it means a total different um, symbol. So this is why details matter because it's literally one word difference and they mean two different things. So this, you know, it's, these are the words that you're going to look for that are indicating, ah, I'm going to be doing a translation type problem. And then I've got some examples of what it might look like. And usually in a word problem, instead of giving you the variable, they'll just say a number or an item. It'll be very vague. And that's where you replace your variable. And then I've got some examples of what that looks like when you translate it in math. So that should be very helpful to you. So the, the first type of just translating is that you just literally have a sentence telling you the relationship. You have to translate it into equation and then you solve. Now, in the same general category where you have translating, you're going to have a specific type where they mention consecutive integers. So you're still translating. They're still going to be using those words like added to, total, twice, you know, the words that are on this chart here. So they're still going to use these words, but it's also going to mention consecutive integers. So these actually pop up a lot in discrete mathematics. So if you're in computer science and you have to take discrete mathematics, these type of problems will show up. Um, but consecutive is like one after another. And here we're looking at consecutive in the pattern. So if it says consecutive integers, it's the next number in the row. And so the difference between them is one. And so for your first number is x, the second one is x plus 1. So if you were given a problem where it said that two consecutive integers add to 10, so, oops, make sure I spell that, two consecutive integers add to 10, you would have the first consecutive integer, which is x. We've got add, so it's going to tell us we're going to add these things together. And the second one is x plus 1, and they're adding up to 10, so they equal 10. So you're translating. You've got the word add. You have to make sure you've, you've got it going to 10. 
but it's telling you specifically the relationship with, between the two numbers. And so based off of the pictures here, we always start at x, and then the next one's going to be x plus 1. And then if it says there's three consecutive integers, the next one will be x plus 2. So they keep going up by 1 each time. Uh, there are also types of consecutive integer problems where you talk about consecutive even or consecutive odd integers. And so these are going every other one, so the difference is 2. So if you start at x, the next one's going to be x plus 2 because it's 2 away. If you need a third one, then it's going to be x plus 4. So you keep adding 2 each time, each time that you need a consecutive integer. So these are a very particular type of problem where it's basically based off of the word consecutive. It's telling you how you are writing each number and you're, you're kind of grouping them together like x and x plus 1. So those are two consecutive integers. And then that allows you to use one variable rather than doing x plus y. You now have one variable and then you can solve for, for the first integer and then use that to find the second integer. So the next type are the cutting into pieces problem. So this is one the I mentioned before um, where you're kind of rewriting things into different, you know, you may have two variables and you rewrite one variable in terms of another. So this is where you have something that you're splitting up into pieces. These are often done, done with lengths of wood or you're cutting something into different pieces and you know the total length and you know that one piece is longer than the other but you don't know how big each piece is. And so you do have to do a translation where it uses some, you know, translating words. Like this is an example from the textbook where it says one piece must be three times as long as the other. So that is, that's a translation indication that it's a translating type of problem. Um, and they usually tell you what one piece is written as and you have to figure out, well, how do I write the other piece? And so there's an example here where if one is x, the other one's three times x. And then if they give you the total, then you add those up and they equal whatever your total length is. Another type is where you've got subtraction. So let's say I've got this long beam here. Let's say I cut it up into pieces and I know the total distance is 12 feet. And let's say I call the shorter piece x then the other one has to be 12 minus x because it's the, the difference left over when you subtract x away from 12. So that's another one where you have to write the second piece in terms of the first piece because otherwise you might just call it x and y, but now you have two unknowns. So you have to rewrite y in terms of what you know and you know, oh, well, it's whatever's left over when I take x away from 12 because it totals 12. So I recommend drawing pictures so you can kind of see that relationship. So I always draw pictures when I have these types of problems. Now, this leads us very nicely into total problems. So we've been kind of doing that because this one, we were writing an equation for a total length of something. And with consecutive integers, you tend to write an equation where you have them equal a total. And totals are where you're adding. So you have equations where you're adding things together. But these, the total type of problems are more general because they're not normally related things that you're adding together. So like when you cut something up into two pieces, those are related into one whole piece. But these types of problems are unrelated groups. So in this example, it's the number of metals for China versus the United States. Total different groups of you know countries, different cr people winning medals but you're looking for the total, so you add them together. And you do have to do some translating. So I didn't include the part that explains why they said x plus 16 is the number of metals won by the United States, but that comes from the translating, because earlier in the problem it says that the United States won 16 more than China. So if x is the number than China, then the United States has 16 more. So it's x plus 16. So you still have that translating going in, going on, which is why it's in the translating group. But it's set up 
uh, very specifically where you've got two separate things equaling a total. So it's like a subset of or similar to some of the other problems, types of problems we've seen so far. Um, now, the last one that kind of falls into this category is slope intercept form type. And um, this is something that you'll learn kind of later in the class. It's actually, we're going to talk about slope intercept form at the very, very, like, uh, second to last week. So week seven, we're going to talk about it. But um, we use the same kind of form of the equation without, you know, graphing, which is what that chapter is focused on. So these are types of equations where you have translating to go on and they give you words and they usually have things like added to or something like that, but you have a base amount and then you have a constant amount added on. So um, like salary, you might have a flat rate for your salary and then you have more added on. Or um, like if you think about um, taking an Uber, there might be a flat fee plus the rate per mile. So these are those types of problems. And so when you're translating, you're really translating, you're looking at, these are sort of a subtype of the total kind of problem rather than the translating type of problem. I guess I could put this in a category for its own now that I think about it. But you're, you, you're writing a total and you're adding things together, but you've got something that doesn't change and then something that does change based off of time, off of miles, you know, off of something, and you're multiplying those things together. So the next major categories are is the, the kind that uses percentages. And these are going to be particularly problems with 1%, because if you have problems that have more than 1%, that's a different type. So these are going to be word problems where you're given 1% in the problem somewhere. So we'll start with the basic percent type of problem. And this will be like, what percent of this is this? those kind of problems. Or we'll say like 10% of the women at the school got an A, how many women got an A or something like that. So those are the most basic type of problems. And so those are using the definition of a percentage to solve. And there are two ways to solve it. So there's, it looks like way I, that's supposed to be way one. It's just the, the font, <laughs> way one. Um, would be your amount equals the percent times the base and the base is like um, the total and you have to convert your percent to a decimal form. The second way is actually my preferred way and you're looking at how many you have out of the whole and then that equals the percent out of 100 and when you solve these you cross multiply I mean, it's basically what we do when we solve linear equations with fractions. You're multiplying to eliminate the fraction. And cross multiplying is the shortcut where you basically multiply the diagonals and set them equal to each other. So it's a shortcut to eliminating the fraction. But that's what you're doing when you're when you're solving something like this as you, you know, maybe how many you have out of the whole and you're looking for the percent or sometimes you uh, know the percent and you know how many you have, but you don't know that what the whole was. Or maybe you don't know what the part was, but you usually have enough information where you can solve this for whatever's missing. And the nice thing about this, using the proportion method where you've got a fraction equals a fraction, you don't have to convert your percent to a decimal. So it's a little bit nicer to work with. So then we've got simple interest problems. And so they're, inter they're considered the, the percent because they, you know, there's an interest rate, which is a percentage. So there's a formula out of these. So you just literally plug your numbers into the formula based off of what you have, and then you solve for what is missing. So it's interest equals the principal, which is your starting amount, times your interest rate, times how many years you're getting interest. And so this formula is I equals PRT. And when you use this formula, you must convert your percent to decimal form. That's very, very common when you're doing types of problems with percentages is that you have to 
convert it to the decimal form. So usually if you see anything, it will say the word simple interest. So you'll know what type it is because it will mention simple interest or it will say interest. And so that, that tells you, OK, I just got to find this formula, I'll plug it in. Now we've got commission problems. And these are pretty nice because it will have the word commission in the problem. So you know, OK, this is where I'm at. So this was another one where there's basically a formula. And so um, often you're not just looking for commission, you'll also look at to find total. So it's like a combination of our total problem with commission. But your commission is basically how much you sold times the percentage that you earn off of that, which is the commission rate. And when you use that formula, you have to use the decimal form. Then your total earned is just whatever your base pay is, because there's usually some base amount plus how much you earned from commission. So it's kind of like a, you, this is one where you've got two equations going on, and you could combine it by taking this part and then replacing it where I have commission right here, because commission is equal to that right thing. So you could make it one formula by substituting where I have commission by the amount in sales times commission rate. And then you can do it in one step. But it's just a matter of determining what do you know? What are you missing? Plug your, your numbers into the formula. Look for what's left over and what you're solving for. Then we've got sales tax and markup. So you may think that sales tax and markup are totally different, but they're not. They're the same type of problem. You're adding on some percentage to the cost. So, you know, markup is done before you buy something basically, and then tax is done after, but you're still adding on a percentage to your cost. So there are two ways to solve these. And I know it looks kind of messy because I'm using tax slash markup so that you know that's the same thing. That's not divide. That's just I'm using the name, whether it's a tax or a markup. But it looks a lot like the commission problem where you take your cost of what it is, you multiply it by the percentage, and then you take your cost and you add that markup amount or tax amount to it. And you have to use your percent as a decimal. Now, the other way to do this is with a proportion, which goes back to our basic percentage problem. And so you have your total, which is basically after you added on extra stuff. And you divide it by the total before you added on the extra stuff. And then that's going to equal 100 plus basically your percentage here. You do not have to convert that to a decimal with this formula. And then you divide it by 100, and then you solve this. So in general, if you there are other types of problems where you're adding on some percent. Um, and they may not be sales tax or markup. It could be you know extra credit. Maybe you're adding on 5% extra credit. You know, any kind of problem where you're adding percent to something gets solved this way. So the sales tax and markup are like a special case of this. But you basically have, and I only do the proportion method because it is the easiest one. You've got your final over the original equals 100 plus whatever that percent is that's getting on, that's getting added on, and then divided by 100. So you just plug in what you know and solve. So um, now we've got discount problems where instead of adding things on, we're subtracting. And these can also be called markdown problems. So they're a lot like the sales tax. It's just um, we're subtracting instead of adding. So the discount is found pretty much the exact same way. You're taking your cost, multiply it by the percentage. And in this case, the total is the cost minus your discount because we're making it cheaper. We're discounting it down. So if you choose to do the proportion method, then you have your total on top, which again is your total after the discount divided by the total before. And then that's equal to 100 minus your discount percentage 
over 100. So in, in general, there are types of problems where you may be getting, you know, percentages subtracted in some case. And so it's basically final amount over original amount equals 100 minus whatever you subtracted over 100. You know, if you're losing 5%, like if there's a late penalty, and this would be the type of formula that you would use if there's like a 5% late penalty. So if you notice that this is very similar to the one where we added, the only difference is that it's a minus versus a plus. So these are basically all part of something called a changing percent or percent change. Is another way that these are falling into and they are all basically the same formula it's just if you're adding it's a plus if you're subtracting it's a minus but it's set up the same way so this is called the plus or minus symbol and we're just using that to indicate that you use plus if it's adding you use minus if it's subtracting and so instead of writing two separate equations, you can use the plus or minus symbol to indicate it's just one equation. You just have to determine, are you using a plus or a minus depending on the situation? So all of these percentage type problems, other than like the first couple, the rest of them where you're doing some sort of increasing or decreasing in percentage can all go back to this one equation. You don't need to have all these separate equations for tax or separate equation for markup or discount or things like that. They don't need separate equations. They can be just this one. So next category are geometry problems. So these are word problems that involve things like area, perimeter, angles, any kind of thing that you see with shapes, essentially. So we've got the perimeter type. So if you see that it's talking about perimeter, bam, you're right here. So perimeter means that you're adding up the length of all of the sides. So some things have three sides, some things have four sides, some things have five. You just, whatever you have, you add them all up. So it's basically like those total problems, but we're adding more than two things together because we need to have a complete shape. Um, there is a special formula for rectangles, which is 2 times the length times 2 times the width. And for squares, the perimeter is 4 times the length of the side, because all four sides are equal. But for other shapes, um, you basically want to kind of draw a picture of the shape, label each side, and then you write your equation by adding up all the sides. So the next type is complementary or supplementary angles. So complementary angles add up to 90 degrees. Supplementary angles add up to 180 degrees. So you need to at least have written down the difference between those. And these are also total problems. You'll get a problem that will say, you know, two complementary angles or you have two complementary angles and one is three times the size as the other one. So you do have some translating going on. So in a way it can fit in with the translation type problems that can fit in with those total type problems, but it's specifically you've got some geometry going on with your picture. So that's why I'm throwing it under the geometry um, type, but I could be convinced to put it on the translation type. Um, another type of problem that you'll see like this is specifically for angles of a triangle where it will ask you to find the angles of a triangle and those add up to 180 degrees. So those are supplementary. So um, if you have a word problem where you're given some sort of relationship between the three angles, you know that you have to add them together and make them equal 180. So those tend to also be translation problems where you're going to do some sort of translating using those words. So I'll just put a little note there that these can also be considered translation problems. 
Now, there are problems involving circles. And so I put circles separately specifically because of the fact that we have pi in them, which is not found in the other formulas. So for a circle, you've got what is called the radius. So the radius is the distance from the center to the, the edge. So we use r for the radius. And then we use pi. So pi is an irrational number. It is about 3.141592. And I think the next one's a 1. That's as much as I have memorized. But 3.14 is good enough. Or a lot of calculators today actually have a button for pi. So you can just use the pi button. Um, but if you're asked to find the circumference, so the circumference is this distance around the outside. And that equation is C equals 2 pi R. So C stands for circumference. So it's 2 times pi times the radius. And then area is pi R squared. So those are the two big formulas that you need to know. And oh, I suppose you could be asked about diameter. Diameter equals um, 2 R. So the diameter is basically 2 times the radius. And so sometimes their circumference is written as pi d, where the diameter is d. So sometimes you'll see it in a different form. So moving on to area type problems, this will be where you know, you're asked to find the area of something. So if it has the word area, ta-da, you're finding the area, you go here. You have to determine what the shape is. Um, I already mentioned area of a circle, which is pi r squared. There's area of a square, which is basically just squaring the side. And we usually use s to represent the side. But you want to be careful it doesn't look like a 5. So it's not a 5. Area of a rectangle is length times width. Or you'll usually just see this as l times w. And I use a cursive l so it doesn't look like a 1. And then you've got area of a triangle, which is 1 half times the base times the height. So if you have some triangle, this is the base. No, this is the base, sorry. And this is the height. You can have other types of triangles. The height is just the part that's perpendicular to the base. So it's not always a side of the triangle. But that's the formula for area of a triangle. So I always draw a picture with these area problems. Um, and just because I like visuals, I think they help me out. But once you've determined it's an area problem, you have your equation, figure out the shape, plug in what you know. Then we've got volume problems. So these are ones where, again, you have some shape and it's asking for the volume. So volume is basically 3D. So um, when you draw your picture, it's a little harder to draw a picture. So volume of a square is the side cubed or s cubed. Volume of a rectangle is length times width times height. So if I attempt to draw a rectangle here, got length, width, height. So you're multiplying those three dimensions together. Volume of a sphere is 2 thirds pi r cubed. And then a volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h, and h is representing height. So those are just some common formulas that you may see if you're asked to find volume of something. And again, usually you'll, give, you'll be told some sort of information, and then you're just finding whatever the missing part is. So our last category is chart type problems. And these are a bit more advanced um, than some of the ones that we've done before. But these are types of problems which usually involve more than one equation. But we can turn it into a single equation or you know, um, an easier type of two equations by making a chart. And so these are set up very specifically. So the first one I'm going to cover are the mixture problems. And these are the ones that most people hate. 
So these involve multiple percentages. So you're not just, if I can get it to write, come on. It does not want to, <laughs> it's like it's skipping and not even erasing. Oh, okay. I don't know what is going on here. It just, percentages. wow, it really doesn't want me to, to write. Okay, <laughs> that was really terrible. It won't let me erase. Okay, so these involve multiple percentages. And so you might be given two things and you've got, let's see, there we go. Actually, I would have, I get, this is going to bug me. I'm like, I got to spell this better. There we go. It was apparently just freaking out on me. Okay. So this would be if you're mixing things together. And like if for some certain types of engines, you have to mix your oil with some gasoline. And so you're mixing things of different percentages, like your oil is one solution, gasoline is another. Um, Antifreeze is a mixture type of problem. And in th these kind of cases, if it asks for pure water, pure is represented basically, if it's pure water, it's usually 0%. If it's pure antifreeze, pure oil, pure gasoline, that's always 100%. And then you have some percent in the middle that you're trying to mix these things to. So you're kind of diluting something in a way. Sometimes it's similar to chemistry where you've got 20% of some acid, 50% of another acid, you're trying to mix them together so that you have a 30% mixture so you can do your chemistry. So you're mixing co different combinations. Um, octane actually is very similar to this. So your gasoline is actually a mixture and you can get a different octane by mixing different, you know, other octanes together. So these are these type of problems. And so we've got this chart. So you've got amount percent and total. And the general rule is that the amount is multiplied by the percent and that equals the total. So you'll have some amount, say like two, and let's say you don't know what the other amount is, so you just call it X. And you know that your total mixture is five, like five liters or something like that. So you fill in those how much you know, and then your variable is basically what you don't know. And then you fill in your percents. And it actually does not matter here whether you use the, the whole number percent or the decimal percent. It doesn't matter. So, um, but I'll use the decimal. So let's say this is 10% and this is 70%. And so you fill in what you know, and sometimes maybe you don't know um, instead of like two and X here, it's maybe you don't know solution one, but you know the other one. And so you're like, okay, well, how do I write this? Solution two would be five minus X. It's kind of whatever's left over. That's kind of like how we did the, the chopping problem where you're splitting something up. So you may have to do a little bit with this amount thing, but you fill in what you know. And on the amount, so your yellow box has to be the total of the two things above it. So x plus 5 minus x, the x is cancel, you're left with 5. So the other yellow box, again, you're adding the two boxes above it. I color coded, so the orange boxes, those go across. And you multiply those and you write the result in the box under total. So you multiply these across and then the box underneath this, this is where you get your equation that you're going to solve and you add them up or maybe you'll have some total here. So you know, let's say that equals 100. I'm just making it up. I don't really know what that equals. And so you write your equation, you have 0.10x plus 0.70 times 5 minus x and equals 100 because the top two need to add up to the bottom. And so you fill in what you know, 
You multiply across, add going down in that last column, and that gives you your equation. So that's the mixture type problem. Similar to this are problems where you are doing simple interest, but you've got more than one percentage. So again, this is when you've got more than one percentage going on. So instead of getting interest on one account, you're getting interest in two accounts. And so it's a little more complicated because now you've got two things that you're worrying about here. So we use our simple interest formula, principal times rate times time. And this is set up very similarly. You multiply across and it equals your last column. And so um, let's say you know that you want to have $10,000 invested and you don't know how much you want to invest in either either one. So one is X, the other one is 10,000 minus X. And then your interest rates. So I'm going to make these, let's say so one is, let's say, 3% and the other one is at 5%. And so they make different rates. And then how many years? Now the word problems usually have for one year, so time is usually one. And then just like in the other problem, you multiply straight across. So I get 0.03x, and I have 0 0.05 times 10,000 minus x, oops, I got a zero. And then let's say you have a goal for interest and you want to make $2,000 of interest. So you take that last column and you add them up to get your equation. So the first two, the orange and the green add up to get to the yellow and then you solve that and that will give you your X, which is your amount in your first investment, and then you can use that to figure out how much is in the second investment. So those are multiple investment problems. And then the last type that we have a chart are distance and uniform motion problems. So these are the type of problems that are very famous on standardized tests where you've got um, you know, a train going in one d direction meets a train going in the other direction or things like that. Um, very, very common, <laughs> you know, and people always hate these things. And I like, I usually like, you know, draw a picture or something like this, but um, you can set these up with a chart. So this particular example is if you're going one, you know, you're, you're got, you're going from home, Oh, my pen's doing its thing again. The battery is probably dying. If so you're going from home to work and let's say traffic one way, it takes you some amount of time. And then the other way, it takes you a different amount of time. Yeah, I should probably check my battery on this thing. So um, you have rate. In this case, the rate is speed. And this is coming from a formula distance equals rate times time. So you're still multiplying and equaling your distance. So you've got your, your rates or your speed. So let's say you know that you're averaging 45 miles per hour to work, but maybe coming home from work, there's rush hour. And so you're now going about 30 miles per hour. We don't put anything in the total for speed because those don't add up. That doesn't make sense. Um, we don't normally worry about adding the time. So let's say 45 minutes, it takes you 20 minutes. And these usually are out of hours, so I can write that as a fraction, 20 minutes out of 60 minutes. And then because you're much going slower, maybe it's now going to take you 30 minutes instead going back. And so you've got this equation and then you would multiply those, get your distance. And so maybe the question is how much, you know, maybe you're looking for the distance, you know, how far was the drive? So you would multiply these together, 45 times 20 over 60, 30 times 30 over 60. And then you would get your equation by adding those up and that would give you X. A different type, is instead of this, okay, I'm going to just use my mouse here because it is my, my keyboard clearly or my stylus is kind of dying. 
So let's say a different type of problem with this kind of thing is let's say you don't know how long it takes. So we can actually use T. We usually use T for time. So let's say we don't know the time, but we know it takes 10 extra minutes, you know, from. So maybe it's whatever the time is plus 10 more minutes. And so, and maybe you know the total distance. You know that the total distance that you drive is, let's say, 40 miles. So you would be then multiplying these. So you get 45t. And then here it would be 30. This is really hard with my mouse. t plus 10. And then you add these up to get your equation. 45t plus 30. This is really painful. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know how I did this before I had a stylus. So you add those up, and then it equals your total. And then you'll, you'll solve. And I'm just making up these numbers, so I don't even know if these problems that I'm making up are going to work. Um, I'm just making them up as an example. But you would go, you would solve this, and then that would give you T, how long it takes you to go to work. And then you can then use that to find out how long it takes you to come home from work. So that's it. So this took about 45 minutes. So um, it is 45 minutes of all the different types of word problems that are linear. And so I recommend really just using this as a reference. So going through, reading your word problem, and then trying to figure out which category does this fit into. Okay, this is how I set it up. This is how I solve it. And hopefully this is really helpful for you so that it makes world word problems much easier than maybe they have been before this. So let me know if it helps, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye.